Hello, viewers. Welcome to another edition of Banking and More, where we bring you the people who matter to discuss the things that matter. Today, we have a special guest, special in every aspect of the world. Our guest today is a celebrated banker mm -hmm. who has been in the industry for more than 30 years in practice, and now she's back to deliver and support the industry through knowledge impartation. And she is in the person of Mrs. Patricia Sapo, the president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers, Ghana. Lady Reverend, as we call her, welcome to Banking and More. Thank you very much, Maxwell. First, tell us, what does the institute do? Okay, the institute, that is the Chartered Institute of Bankers, where primarily the Chartered Institute of Bankers is mandated to promote the study of banking in Ghana and also to regulate the practice of the banking profession in Ghana and other related banking services. So that is primarily our mandate. So while Bank of Ghana regulates the institutions, you regulate the professionals? Exactly. We regulate the professionals. Okay. We provide tuition. We provide certification for qualified members certifying them as professionals for the banking industry. Okay, okay. So what it means is, uh, if I walked into Ecobank or Barclays or GCB, any banker I saw, there would be a product of the institute certified, so to say, or we have some that are not certified. Yes, I mean, we have professional bankers. Those are the chartered bankers. And then we have banking officials. I will not call them bankers. They are banking officials. But the bankers are the professional bankers who have gone through the um, banking profession and have been certified as professional bankers. Okay. Yeah. What's the difference and what's the impact to the industry? Well, primarily, um, the difference is that the chartered bankers have gone through a banking program and a banking course and therefore have been certified. Like when you go to a hospital, you see a doctor. He's gone through the medical program. So the bankers have gone through the banking course and have been certified. Other people that work in the bank also will understand banking, but they don't have that certification. So that is the distinction between a professional banker and also a banking official. The institute has been in existence for uh, 42 years now. You are the first female president, and uh, that, that means a lot for gender advocates and, and, and uh, equality. In the 42 years of its existence, what would you say its role has been in the banking industry in Ghana and in the financial sector? Well, I think to a very, very large extent, the Chartered Institute of Bankers has really impacted positively in the banking industry by way of churning out banking professionals, you know, supporting the um, economy of Ghana. Um, if you look at ethics, you come out as a chartered banker, adhering to the code of ethics of the profession. So that is one contribution. And then also the kind of knowledge you acquire during the training. When you work, you work with understanding. You understand the rationale behind what you are doing. You go with the principles and the practices of the profession. So to a very large extent, I believe that the Chartered Institute of Bankers has contributed significantly to shaping banking in Ghana. So if I went through the institute, and someone else who didn't go through the institute. What would be the difference between the two of us in practice, in terms of remuneration, in terms of appeal? I mean, certainly if you are working in a bank and you are recruiting, you want to recruit. Your obvious choice would be somebody who really understands banking, who has studied banking. Of course, you won't go to um, the hospital, you want to recruit, and then you recruit somebody who is not a doctor 
but that is not to say that people really don't understand medicine. So obviously the appeal and the first and obvious choice will be the chartered banker. The difference is that this chartered banker really has full understanding of banking and the various aspects of banking when you come to lending, when you come to operations, when you come to trade, transfers, investments, etc. The chartered banker has gone through all those courses and therefore understands. Anybody that is recruited in the banking industry will now have to learn on the job, you know, and so may work and perform, but the original rationale and the reason why things are done may not come readily mm -hmm. to the person. Mm -hmm. But the chartered banker works with understanding. So when you look at um, the number of chartered bankers in the system, vis-a-vis -vis the challenges we have in the system, do you, don't you think that if we, we, we got to the point where we had 70, 80% of the practitioners chartered and going through the institute, it would have reduced the issues to do with uh, unprofessionalism, lack of ethics, and, and on all the challenges that the industry faces. Yes, in fact, that is precisely where we are heading towards. And um, by God's grace, the Chartered Institute of Bankers is now operating under Act 991-2019. That mandates the Institute to regulate the practice of banking in Ghana. In collaboration with the Central Bank and also the Ghana Association of Bankers, per the acts that we have, we are having an industry code of conduct and ethics where everybody that works in the banking industry will be under that code of conduct. And so that will really help. So we are going to have one umbrella, whether we're a chartered banker or not. Once you are working in the banking industry, you are obliged to comply to the code of conduct of the banking industry. Of course, I mean, other professionals also in the banking industry will also be um, aligned to their own professionals. But then, if even you are a professional, say a chartered accountant, once you're also working in the bank, you also are obliged to conform to the code of ethics of the banking industry. And, and that should help sanitize uh, some of the challenges? Well, that will help a great deal because this is a collaboration between the Central Bank, the Chartered Institute of Bankers, and the Ghana Association of Bankers. So we are working as a team to bring uniformity in the way members of the banking industry should operate. Let me understand, shouldn't it be compulsory for everybody to be chartered, looking at the positives that it presents to the individual, to the banking sector, to the economy? Certainly, certainly that is the case. And we are advocating for that. But we are also aware of the fact that that would take a bit of time. So we are still working with the Ghana Association of Bankers to promote the banking profession you know, so that as many people as possible in the banking industry will take part in the program and also get certification. What we have also doing is some people have worked in the banking industry for a long time. They have a lot of experience, they have a lot of knowledge. So we are having some sort of specialized programs for them that will get them to um, understand or align to some of the things or the courses we are doing. And in that way, we can also give them some sort of certification. You know, so for people who have worked for a long time, they have the experience, they have the skill, etc. There is a customized program too that we are putting in place that will help them also to be part of the um, professionals that we have. Let's now turn our attention to professionalism, ethics, and its impact on the industry. Between 2017 and 2019, the Bank of Ghana withdrew the licenses of nine banks. Together with the Securities and Exchange Commission, a total of 
402 institutions lost their licenses. And some of the reasons were that the players, the management, the boards, the staff were not abiding by the defined codes of ethics and the rules of the game. As an institute that is in charge of policing ethics and ensuring that human capital is properly developed, what do they make of it? Within that period, when the banks were going down, as an institution, how did you feel? If you look at the whole banking industry, I will first of all want to commend um, the banks um, for the level of sanity that has prevailed in the banking industry. Um, the, the training that has gone on, the kind of supervision, etc. But unfortunately, we found ourselves in this kind of situation. And obviously, we can all attribute it to poor corporate governance, poor lending practices here and there. And we were, we were unfortunately, everybody in Ghana was not too pleased about what happened. Um, that is why we believe that the Act 930, um, that is governing all the banks and the financial institutions, and then also the Act 991, that is also in place, will help improve banking practice, professionalism, and the and best practices in the banking industry. So certainly, we wish things were in the way they went, but it's, it's a way of life, or it's part of life. And so um, we, as an institute, are trying to engage the various institutions so that we bring greater awareness and also implement and enforce code of ethics that will be coming out hopefully very soon before the end of the year, you know, that will apply to all bankers. Mm. From human capital perspective, how do you think we can strengthen um, ethics? We can show that compliance really wouldn't be something we say, but we act so that it prevents a repeat. Well, I believe that banking thrives on integrity. And it thrives on ethics. And therefore, enforcing the banking code of conduct going forward will really, really help the industry. In the sense that if anybody does not abide by the code of conduct, the person's name is, is sent to the central bank, to the chartered instance of bankers, to the Ghana Association of Bankers, so that the person does not find himself working anywhere in the banking industry. These are some of the things we are going to enforce, you know, going forward. And if it comes to naming and shaming, that will be done, you know, in the banking industry. So I believe that once we are able to put some of these things in place, it will create a lot more awareness and then people will be conscious of what they are doing. Great. We are going through a pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is changing the way everything is done. As an institute, that impacts knowledge, that teaches and, 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 and educates. How has it impacted you? Well, I think the COVID has impacted every facet of the economy and also the world. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a new day. Certainly, our way of teaching has changed. We are not getting students together in one location to teach them as we were doing before. To that end, we have put a virtual um, training program in place where a virtual learning center where our members from wherever they are, you know, they assess our programs through online training programs, online lecturing, online access to information. 
So this is how this has impacted um, the Institute. But I think it also has its advantages in the sense that members now don't have to commute to the Institute, you know, going through all the traffic, petrol, etc., to come and study. At the comfort of their homes or wherever, they have access to the same quality of information. So that is the way it has impacted the Institute. And I think we are on top of what we are doing and we are seeing the results. Great. So what it means is learning continues seamlessly. Absolutely. How do you think the banking sector will evolve out of this pandemic? What kind of banking sector are we going to have after this is all gone? Well, I think everything in the world has changed. And technology is going to drive everything. And again, I will want to commend the banks. Because in the past two, three years before the pandemic, most of the banks embarked on a digital agenda and also place a lot of their services on their digital platforms. And so customers were accustomed or um, used to online services, bringing a lot of convenience. And therefore, when the pandemic arose, it was a lot easier for people to transact business or their banking activities on their online. This, I believe, is going to continue. And I think that going forward, um, banks will have to strengthen their, their technological um, activities to make banking services more accessible to clients. Currently, there are basic services that would, one can always get on one's phone. But when it comes to other complex activities, I believe that banks will have to find ways of also providing services that will meet such. In some jurisdictions, when you talk of open banking, you have the telcos, I believe that there, there should be a very good relationship between the banks and the telcos. And I think that is the future of banking. Should that collaboration include shareholding, telcos taking stakes in banks and the reverse? Well, I think that should be an arrangement between the banks and the telcos. But I think there should be a very strong collaboration between the banks and the telcos. And I, I, I was on a program in the UK last year, and the telcos are now actually, in fact, some telcos now have permission to have access to the accounts of customers with the permission of their customers. So they have access to the accounts of customers, and they are now able to advise their customers they are able to move monies from their customers' accounts into other um, banks where the customers will get better services. You know, to the extent that, you know, they are even collaborating with um, shops and giving credits to clients, guaranteeing um, purchases that will be made by clients. That is the telcos. This is how far they are moving. And so I believe that the future of banking is going to be exciting. And it's not going to be a matter of competition, but it's going to be a matter of collaboration, where the, the, the banking will ride on technology to bring the needed convenience to customers. That's good. And we, can, we, are, we are even seeing it from the, the small operation or interoperability activity that is ongoing with banks, moving their funds onto the mobile money network. But one of the things that 
we foresee or we think the pandemic is going to bring is branchless banking, where customers could transact business from the comfort of their homes and banks will have to close down some branches. Are we going to get there? How soon can we? I, I don't think people will want to um, embark on a transaction, a $100,000 transaction okay. on a mobile phone or online. So the face-to-face -face interaction and banking will still be there. But the basic, basic, basic day-to-day -day transactions, obviously, I see that will be phased off. But the corporate banking aspect of banking, I believe that will still be there. In as, even though people will operate remotely, but that's face-to-face -face banking will still be there. Mm -hmm. So we would have limited branch network as in brick and mortar, mm -hmm. but then the face-to-face -face banking will still be there. There are some people that no matter what, they still want to go to the bank mm -hmm. to transact business because they believe that the face-to-face -face transactions you know, bring confidence and satisfaction to them. So I don't think that brick and mortar banking will be phased out completely. It will be phased out, it will be minimized, you know, but the face-to-face -face transaction will still go on because it has its benefits. You need advisory services. You want to go and sit down and chat and understand. So at the corporate level, I, I think that is still, it will still be existing. Reverend Patricia Sapo is the president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. Before becoming the president, she was the vice president. And in the course of being the vice president, she was the head of marketing and communications at uh, Ecobank Anglophone West Africa. We are here having a discussion on banking, specifically on human capacity building. And we are talking about virtual banking in place of fiscal banking. So as we migrate or we increase the rate at which we use technology or digital services in the banking sector, it means that the relevance of human beings will also be reducing. And it also means that the, the capacity required to match up to the trend will shift from book-based to digital-based. As a capacity building institution, how are you moving in that direction too? I think that this is very good for the chartered institute of bankers. And the reason why I'm saying that is that I initially said that we, there should be a collaboration between the banks and the telcos. Now, products are being developed. Services are being developed. Now, a chartered banker has gone through training and understands the processes. And so I can see going forward that the telcos will now be employing chartered bankers in developing digital products because they understand the rationale and the concept and the consequences and the risk and how things are operated. So this is rather going to create the need for more chartered bankers in the industry. Okay. So that you see chartered bankers in the telcos helping in developing products, and then also having chartered bankers also in the banks. So from the back end, you need chartered bankers. From the front end, you need chartered bankers. And then beyond that, we also are empowered also to license people who train bankers. And therefore, you have chartered bankers also training people all across. All banking courses that are being taught, you have chartered bankers also being there training. So from end to end, the need for chartered bankers will be very critical. Because I can't see a telco developing a product without writing the processes. You need chartered bankers 
who really understand, you know, the end to end of it. So I think for us, um, it's, 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 some, it's an opportunity that we, we really welcome. Will you have to evolve your core structure? Well, which we have done. Yes, which we have done, and hopefully we are going to launch our new core structure before the end of the year. Okay. And we are putting the um, curriculum and course materials also together. But the governing council has approved this, okay. and um, hopefully I think that just later part of 2021, okay. um, we will have our first examination by God's grace. Give me an idea. How different will that be from the old one, the new core structure and then the old one, how different would it be? Well, you know, things have changed. And um, for instance, in the past, you will talk about customer service. Now, in the new core structure, we are looking at customer centricity, where everything that the institution does as a bank, you know, centers around the customer. Um, in developing products, it's about the customer. You know, after sales, um, services is all about the customer. So that is, in the past, it was customer service, but we have moved from customer service to customer centricity. We are also looking at what we call design thinking, you know, in our new curriculum, where we are looking at innovation, we are looking at creativity in, in banking, and um, just ahead of the customer, being proactive to the needs of the customer and developing products that will help meet the needs of the customer. So these are some of the things um, we are looking at. We brought um, compliance also into the curriculum and so many other things. And also we have a whole diet for digital banking. So for our members that want to move directly into digital banking where they are going to support the telcos in the development of products and services to meet the changing needs and expectations of the clients. We also have that. So for us, I think that we are very excited about the new trend and changes that are coming and we are well positioned to handle, handle them. Great. Let's talk about you and the Institute. You are the first female president. First, how did you feel breaking that glass ceiling, so to say? Well, I think I was really very happy and excited. I was happy and excited for one reason. And the reason was to encourage other women to know that it was possible and is possible and for women to believe in themselves. One thing that I have seen, and I believe I, this is my opinion. Okay. It's, it's certainly my opinion. I believe that women have whatever it takes to handle any task given to them. My encouragement to women is for them to be very bold. I think that is where the challenge is, and that is why I believe in the affirmative action. <laughs> yeah. I think that women in themselves don't like competition. That is what I think is a major weakness in women. They don't like competition, and therefore, they wouldn't want to come out and compete because they don't like this kind of aggressiveness, insults, etc. They don't want to go through all that. But that is not to say that they cannot perform. So if you give the woman the opportunity and the ability, mm. the woman will perform impressively. Mm. But where one has to come out and compete, I will encourage women to do, do that. that. And I will encourage men to support women in all these things they are doing. As the first female, what do you think your position means to the young girl out there, that young banker who is a female and is looking up to you? What does it mean? Well, I, I, I think that, and I'm very passionate about this, and I wish I would have a whole hour uh, to talk about this. But 
I want that young female banker that is there to believe in herself and to know that there are limitless opportunities around. That that young lady banker can be the president of Ghana, not just the president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers, and that she has whatever it takes. So I just want to encourage women to rise up to the challenge. You know, identify who they are, believe in themselves, add value to themselves, be bold and be confident, you know, and um, just stand out and contribute to society. The ultimate in life, I believe, is giving back to society. So I'm just encouraging all women, wherever you are, that you can make it and you have what it takes to make it and to make a difference. Okay, so young lady banker out there, believe in yourself, believe that you can and you will be able to make it. We've had a, a very insightful conversation with Reverend Mrs. Patricia Sapon. She's the first female president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. She's the first to occupy that position in the 42-year history of the Institute. We are grateful for the time that you also spent with us. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for being with us on Banking and More. I am your regular host, Maxwell Adumbila. <laughs>